This is a continued discussion of the S-22, which is an act to implementing the fundament, uh, uh, excuse me, the expansion of juvenile jurisdiction. I still get myself an expungement from yesterday. Um, and our first witness is Commissioner of Corrections, Jim Baker. Jim, I think. Um, Good morning. Good morning. I think the basic question, and I, I don't think it's a surprise, is what do you do with people between the ages of, uh, under the age of 18, who are committed to the Commission of Corrections? Right. So, you know, as it stands now, um, they would be at Woodside. And, um, you know, as that discussion continues to go, um, for example, if Woodside was to close tomorrow, we would have to find, um, uh, in the current situation, one of the folks that are in our custody is um, 15. Um, that would complicate that for us greatly because we can't put them in a facility sight and soundproof, so we would have to find arrangements where, you know, we would put 24-hour security on them. Now, if they were to 16 or anybody above 16, um, there is the option of putting them in a correctional facility where we would have to sight and soundproof it away from the general population. And certainly our position at Corrections is, is that's not something we want to be doing for a whole host of reasons. I mean, I, you know, I guess it's case to case, but, um, you know, it's our opinion at Corrections that um, 16, 17 year old, no matter what the offense is, and, you know, um, you know, the folks being held right now, as I understand, it was a pretty serious offense, pretty violent. Um, but even in that case, to put him into a location in a room that's not much bigger than this, sight and sound proof, we have to bring their food to them. Um, people have to come to them. You can't move them around the facility. You can't program them. Um, is not a place for you know juveniles that age. So, you know, I, I think that's been a long-standing position of corrections long before I arrived in January, and uh, certainly that's not a situation we want to find ourselves in. Obviously, if it was to occur, um, we have to do what we have to do, and we have to follow the law, which is sight and soundproof. My understanding is the administration plans to close Woodside on, on or about June 30th, um, and uh, it'll eventually be used for the Department of Mental Health Program facility. Um, they're planning to tear it down. But I, I guess that's the plan. I, I, um, and I. I remember back when we had to provide two corrections officers, three shifts, to house somebody who was on detention who was under the age of 18, but the judge had placed them in DOC um, custody rather than um, DCF. That's when the MOU was developed between corrections and DCF. DCF that was good side for that population. Yeah, look, you know, what you just described there is basically babysitting. You know, that's not. No, and it shouldn't be a you know, it shouldn't be a function. I mean, the function should be. Obviously, they're in custody, you know, based upon the court's wishes. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the process of working with them should start right away. You don't have any contracts with private contractors. We, like, as as it stands right now, we do not. Could they? Could a private contractor take somebody if they're? I, I, I'm going to guess yes, but I don't know. Listen, I, you know, I I'd want to run that by our general counsel and make sure that I'm not missing something in statute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you said if Woodside were to close today, we would have to find a situation, um, as though there's not currently any. Um, well, any well, contingency plan, is, is that actually the case? No, we, we could accommodate um, one of those two folks that are in Woodside right now in Rowland mm -hmm. by sight soundproofing an area in Rowland. Well, but I mean, what about the other? The other, uh, and don't hold me to the center, but I think the other individual will turn 16 over the summer. 
So the issue of June 30th is, is, a, is a challenge for us. And, uh, you know, um, because in that case, they can't go to the facility because they're under 60. Right. So, you know, the it seems the obvious worry that people have is that <coughs> June 30th is coming up very quickly. There's there's not well, uh, a viable plan now. So, would I, I, can I ask this? Sure. Would the administration be willing to push back the closure date if it doesn't have a solid plan? Uh, what I would say to that is I would encourage the administration to put, push back the date. Right. If, and just as far as the plans, you know, uh, you know, DCF commissioner and I have been talking quite regularly about this issue, right? About how, how to try to come up with, with uh, a plan. And I think uh, he's waiting for some RFPs to come back. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're, we're not doing anything. But as I sit here today, I can't tell you this is a definite plan. That's right. I, and I, I understand that. I guess I'm, I'm just thinking waiting for our RFPs to come back three months till closure date. Mm -hmm. So if the RFPs come back a month before closure, is that? Yeah, no, I, I, think, the, I think the RFPs are probably due back any time now because they've been out okay. for, for a few weeks. This conversation started with Ken yeah. probably. Yeah. Uh, this is helpful. This, this, you know, started right around the time that we met with you, Senator, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, no, so. I think it's a, something that, well, I mean, one of the, ideas that's been floated is um, having Woodside become a Department of Corrections facility which would take people under the age of 21 or something. Um, and I don't know how many of those people you, those people, how many offenders you have that are right, 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 under I, the age of 21? I, I just asked for that number. I may have, no, it's not back yet. I just asked for that number. So, so you anticipated. No, no, I, you know, my, my good friend Steve Howard gave me a tip off. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's one, it's one option. Um, you know, there, for those of you who aren't familiar with my history, back to 1969, I got hired at the St. Albans Correction Facility. So There's going to be a youthful offender facility for those under, I think it was under the age of 25, but I don't remember. And it was 40 beds. And I believe Woodside is still licensed for 30. Right. Just kind of a crazy thing is how, you know. Uh, but to your point, Senator, I, I, will, I will go back and discuss with Secretary Smith the issue around the date because um, I haven't had that conversation with him in a couple of weeks. So, yeah, I think it, we won't know after town meeting if the RFPs can through. Uh, correct. I would urge that, and I think it's important that at least you look at the options of some other program being able to, you know, that currently operates. But, you know, I, and in my conversations, you know, particularly uh, with a 15 year old, but I, I know correct. that you've expressed. We do not want to have under 18 at what? Well, you know, we'd have to do what we have to do if we had to do it. But I'm going to say it again. I, I don't think, based on the people that are advising me that know this better than I do, but I just think it's common sense that you've got, um, it's just not the way to start um, working with someone that may find himself in that position at the age of 16 or 17. I mean, they're basically locked into an area where it's, it's isolated, and uh, I can't imagine that's healthy for anybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Back when I operated 204, we had both DCF and DOC clients. Some of them were in combination of both, and they were up to the age of 18, um, and uh, it was hard to tell the difference, to tell you the truth, between the corrections and the DCF. Yeah, and, and, you know, and as you know, I mean, you were the justice. Yeah, the probation officer visited some of the kids, and the social worker was in there. But, but that setting is much different than being in a, in yeah, a, yeah. In a yeah. lock facility yeah. with doors slamming and, yep. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You and, know. and I don't know that, that whether or not any community-based program can handle those two kids. Right. Those three, well, the two corrections. <coughs> Correct. I but I think it's worth, you know, the approach that we're taking is, it's worth getting people in to talk to them about because yeah. it, it can, you know, 
every case is different and it can range. And so, you know, in this case, I don't know that much. I know it was a, the allegation is a very serious crime. Yeah. It was very violent. Assuming if a 15 year old is charged Correct. with adult court, it has to very, be. Very violent crime. Um, but I'll say it again, even though the nature of the crime is violent, you know, um, you really need to start working. I mean, just to, to put him into a facility to detain him and not start working with him, this kind of goes against what the what, what our mission in corrections is. Well, Commissioner, you've left more but, answers, yeah. but, I, but you know what, Senator? Was that's one the of nice days. thing about being in Toronto. It is. <laughs> but you know, it, it was one of my easier days in here. How many days that's left? The, you know, I don't know. No, that's good. That's uh -oh. a good sign. That's good. That's, good. Right? that's, that's, a, no, that's not good a good sign. sign. That is a good sign. Well, so not what, for you maybe, but uh, for your wife. Well, let me just let me let me do some quick math here. It's uh, <laughs> thirty-one days in March, right? Yeah. So Saturday, Sunday, six, 62 days. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll leave you with that thought, sir. <laughs> not a good it. thought. But by the way, we appreciate what you've done. Mm -hmm. thus far to improve things in the Department of Corrections. Um, you know, I know this is not part of this testimony, but you know this. There's, uh, there's some very dedicated people that are working really hard. And uh, um, I'm just trying to be their cheerleader, Senator. I uh, appreciate it. AJ? Um, yes, by the way, there's, there's a copy of Judge Crawford's ruling in your file somewhere. Yeah. Um, I don't know where I put mine, but I did read it over. And I, frankly, I was shocked. And I don't usually get shocked. So, I, but I, I've got my folder. I've got Judge Crawford right here. Yeah, you um, do. You know, it, it, I've got one someplace here. It's in your, it's it's the first uh, thing in your folder. tells me a lot about what was happening okay. there. And you know, I, had, I had focused on the uh, restraint. But the focus of the ruling is on seclusion. I mean, it's partly on the restraint, obviously, but part of it is on the restraint. So maybe you can say a few words about where you see it, where you see what was good side then, what side made any significant changes. Any thoughts on the closure of one side or whatever you want? Sure, thank you, Senator. So my name is A.J. Rubin. I'm an attorney at Disability Rights Vermont. We are your mental health care ombudsman as well as a federal protection advocacy system. I'm lead counsel in the case that you're reading about. It's an on, it's ongoing litigation. We've got another um, status conference in front of Judge Crawford on Tuesday, um, March 10th, I think. Um, and so, um, that's, so it's ongoing litigation. Um, it, in terms of what happened and what the court was ruling about, um, you know, what I want to say is that uh, I have been working at, with Woodside since 1993 when I was a public defender in Rutland, and our office has had a lot of concerns with Woodside over the years. In 2006 and 2007, we issued two pretty scathing reports about things like lack of air conditioning, lack of janitorial services, lack of educational space, lack of mental health treatment. Back then, 10, 12 years ago, we negotiated with then commissioner of DCF, um, his name is Steve Dale. Hmm? Steve Dale. With, with Steve Dale. And instead of litigating that case, we were able to negotiate and, and, and make improvements, like putting in air conditioning so the kids weren't writing letters saying that they were going to die and suffocating in heat in the summer. Putting in an educational whole building, basically, so there would be real educational service, and augmenting mental health services. Um, and so we've been very engaged, and personally I've been in it for about 20 some odd years now. Um, the bottom line is, you know, the building of, uh, Buildings of General Services said two or three years ago that the building is not appropriate for treatment of mental illness. You know, that's a flat out statement. It's not appropriate for treating mental illness. Um, I, I think from the work I've done on Woodside, the, the big problem that we, we face is that it's con we're confused about what Woodside's supposed to be. Um, it was originally, as you know, built to detain two juveniles who committed a horrible crime. And then over time, including with the help of our office, it moved towards a mental health treatment facility. And as I said, after 2006 and 2007, they instituted a lot more mental health and educational services. 
And then when, when funding became tight in state government and the department tried to use Medicaid funding to float the budget, it forced the department to move even further towards a mental health treatment model. And then you all, the legislature, changed the mission of Woodside to make it statutorily a, a, a residential mental health treatment program. That was to get the money. That was to get the money. Yet, it confused what the place is. And so now what you have, really, are three reasons that, that Woodside is being used. One is for uh, Commissioner Baker's people. You know, um, young people charged with crimes who may not have a residential mental health treatment need. They're just too young to go to prison, but they've been held on bail. Then there's people from the interstate compact. Uh, where like a kid runs away from Kentucky and they show up here and we have to hold them securely before we send them back. Some kids like that show up in Woodside. Again, they don't have a mental health residential treatment need necessarily. But then there are the kids who do have significant mental health treatment needs. And, and some of those kids um, have significant trauma histories and, and personality disorders that involve aggression and self-harming and those kids have never had a place in Vermont to treat them. Woodside was the place we put those kids, and you saw what happened based on the federal court order. I'm happy to report those kinds of kids, kids with severe behavioral disorders, kids who self-harm, kids who cannot be in a milieu, they have to be isolated because they're so um, uh, aggressive or dysfunctional, those kids are no longer going to be put in Woodside because of the court's order that you read. That's part of the, the, the impact of that. Um, and a bunch of other things were changed so the there. The girl that is described in the video and the, uh, they had a choice between mental health and Woodside, and they chose Woodside for some reason. So that's not really accurate, Senator. I mean, I, they, they had no choice. Uh, those, the problem was us. We, the people of Vermont, failed these kids. We do not have a place to put kids with behavioral disorders that are trauma sensitive and self-harming. And so we as a, as, a, as, a, as a state had no choice but to put those kids on one side because the hospitals who we don't control, the emergency rooms, wouldn't, wouldn't let us put the kids there or keep the kids there or they put a lot of pressure on the state so to move the kids out. The retreat and then was moved from Brattleboro retreat, which couldn't handle her to Woodside. Right, so that's not true either. That's not accurate. No, it's not that they couldn't handle her, uh, Senator. It's that there's a group of people, and it's not just kids. We fail adults, too, but, but there's a group of people who have mental illnesses like personality disorders and other things that don't get better in hospitals. In fact, it's, it's bad for them because they want to be institutionalized. Hospitals are really good for short-term uh, treatment with medication, but some of these kids and adults they have behavioral disorders like cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavioral therapy and deep benches of highly trained people who don't get burned out in, in environments that don't re-traumatize folks. That's what's needed. We don't have that. We send a lot of kids out of state. I know. So for, not just in DCF custody, in the agency of education custody, in the department of mental health custody. There's over 100 kids out of state. Some of those kids have these very difficult behavior problems. You know, I believe that the state employees, if they were well-trained and well-supervised you know, in a different environment, could and probably should do that work because um, I've heard people who run programs, private programs like CL and, and other ones, say they need a backstop for kids with these very difficult behavioral problems. With, who are, they, these are mental illnesses that are not treatable in hospitals. But they also get worse when you lock people up. And we don't have that, we don't have that capacity in Vermont. We don't really have it for adults, but especially for kids. So it seems to me that we need that capacity uh, desperately. And that's the capacity that I'm worried about as a, as a lawyer for disability rights. These other two things that Woodside is being used for don't necessarily involve kids with significant disabilities or, or you know, the kids that are there. There's, but that's a handful of kids. You know, I think if you ask DCF and TOC, there's like five or six kids, maybe seven or eight a year. Who, who are in those two buckets, but mostly you got kids who have serious behavioral disorders that need really significant treatment. And that's, I guess, my pitch to you all is that um, the building in Woodside is not, is not appropriate to treat anybody who has a mental illness, children well, or adults. We could go on and on mm. why that decision was made, but it was obviously made to match the Medicaid money. 
that they thought they were going to get. You know, I would like to say that, that um, you've, you'll hear a lot of testimony. The science and how you treat children has definitely changed in the last 30 years since we built it. So I, I, I don't believe that the department is, is misstating the truth when they say we should be treating kids with these very serious behavioral disorders in non-locked, non-prison-like environments. I think that they're right about that. At the last time we spoke about Woodside, um, the issue regarding see all and restraints came up. Mm -hmm. And I asked Jim Henry to look at the number of delinquents that have been restrained, and it's extremely low right. um, to maybe none. And he's going to testify later. But what we heard from someone from DCF was that it was three kids, basically, with a hundred of the restraint, which tells me that those three kids were probably placed in the wrong place. And it also tells me that this girl was placed in the wrong place. A absolutely. I mean, and it, that's the fault failure. of the administration, not of the staff at Woodside or the staff at Seal or anywhere. You know, I think, it's, I think it's all of our fault, Senator. I mean, there is no, there is no capacity in Vermont for those kids. No, I, I'm, I'm a part-time legislator, you know, and I have to go by what the administration tells us. And when they wanted to go to this, get the Medicaid money, they made certain commitments. Mm -hmm. And then they hired a person who was expert in corrections and restraint tactics, taught those restraint tactics. This is what Judge Trumpet says taught those restraint practices, and then the staff use those restraint practices, which are not appropriate. And according to Judge Crawford, I'm not an expert in restraint. Um, and then, but then further used a lot of seclusion that Jim Baker couldn't use in a correctional facility. I, 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 you know, we've done that here in this committee. We've looked at the use of segregation I don't know the difference between segregation and seclusion, by the way. Um, but, you know, we don't even allow corrections to use that the way that they were using it at Woodside. Well, I would say that our office has, has had federal litigation against the Department of Corrections regarding their use of, of isolation of people with mental illness, and I, I would say that problem has not solved. But it is certainly improved. But you're right. But again, to, to defend the people who worked at Woodside with some very troubling kids, um, they were not given any option. They didn't have the ability to say, you know what, this isn't working for us, let's go someplace else. They were considered the last resort, and that was unfair to them, and it's not okay as a, as a government to, to do that, um, I, I think. But th what there is, I mean, going forward, we can talk about what's wrong in the past. Going forward, there's a great need for a, 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 a capacity in the northern part and the southern part of the state to work with kids with these incredibly difficult behavior disorders. There's a, there's a need for that currently. Um, and many of those kids are being placed at 204 Depot Street, and they're racking up lots of restraints, which is going to draw a lot of attention. Um, and it's not good for anyone. It's the wrong placement. So there is a need for more capacity. Um, and our, you know, our feeling is that um, it, would be, it would have been nice if, if the state administration would have, by now, had that on, you know, created or ready to go, as opposed to hoping that the private sector will fulfill that. I've heard private sector people say, we need a state back, backstop. Um, and the backstop can't be a detention facility. Mm -hmm. It has to be an appropriate treatment facility that, again, needs a deep bench of highly trained people. See all now is a detention facility. It is not a treatment facility. I, I don't personally believe that. I, I understand that these kids had these, you know, these kids were chins. It's supposed to be temporary. Absolutely. And I've talked to some other legislators about what's going to happen to Woodside when it doesn't close July 1st, because I don't think that's really realistic. And what I would offer to you is that there, what's nice about Woodside now is there's very few kids there and there's some tight rules about it. I think the legislature should, should continue um, regulating Woodside if, you're, if it's going to stay open to so sort of minimize the number of kids who are there and have time frames for how fast they have to get out um, to help move us towards not using that building because it, for, for kids with for people with mental illness at least. All right. Well, there's a lot of reasons why that's not realistic. There's about three and a half million of them sitting in the governor's budget where he took the money. That was the, the roughly six million dollars that he took for Woodstock. That was 
budget from Woodside shows AHS savings or hmm. uh, I, the term wasn't savings, it was streamlining or something like that. So that was part of his thirteen million and not having to to cut elsewhere. And there's I believe two and a half million left, but unfortunately they've spent about five hundred thousand more on substitute care. Hmm than they planned, so there's probably a little less than two million left. But that's the reality for those of us that sit on appropriations is they put us in a hole and uh, we struggle with that hole and the people upstairs and house appropriations um, are looking for advice from the administration and I agree with them. I don't see any way they can close Woodside on the first of July. Mm. <clears throat> I don't know where those kids will go. I'm particularly concerned about the two corrections kids, but they've changed the admissions policies so that um, places like Seattle are getting tougher kids, but they're not increasing the resources to those programs to be able to handle those kids. So then, two or three years from now, you come down on Seattle. Or sooner than that, depending on what happens. But, but you know, I think what we have to look at this as, as a great opportunity. It, it's a great opportunity. There's going to be money freed up from Woodside because everyone, almost everyone agrees that we shouldn't keep putting children with mental illness conditions in there. So there is an opportunity and, and we're clarifying what's being needed. And I would just ask you as on the Appropriations Committee to consider these, these 100 kids who are out there and, and and, and reconsider the department's request last year. Remember last year they made this pretty gigantic 30-bed request for like $30 million? But within that request, I think, was an idea that you might bring back some of these kids who were placed in the out-of-state programs because you would develop the capacity in Vermont. I, I know it's hard to come up with giant money, but we are spending millions, probably millions of dollars, I haven't looked exactly, in about 100 kids out of state, and we desperately need this capacity in Vermont. So I would hope we look at it as an opportunity. Yeah, well, the problem is that mm -hmm. all went downhill on that. <laughs> I think I had a list of all those out of state, but I piled it somewhere else. Yeah, we do have one. Huh? We, I think we do have one. Yeah, there's a report that they did of um, somebody in the AHS did all the teams. I think it's right, actually. This is a regional and state uh, residential data. I've, I've reviewed it. I know that I have. I know that the department has an RFP out to study the residential capacity in Vermont, um, and you know it's, it's it's high time we do that because again, That's the, we shouldn't have these all these kids out of state. There's there's two reports I think, one, two RFPs, one for that study, and mm -hmm. the other is the the replacement of which side. Okay. So yeah. we really need two different. Um, facilities or whatever you wanted to find. One for those five to seven kids that are under um, corrections or under the interstate compact that don't need mental health treatment. And then another, another um, something else for all those kids who are, need serious, serious mental health. I mean, I mean, I know the retreat has an adolescent unit, but that isn't for those, not, not that level of kids. Right. These are people who don't right. do well in hospitals. And right. what I would say, Senator, is that um, we, I think you're right that there are these two buckets. There are people who have very kids who have very serious residential mental health needs. Yeah. And then there are kids who are caught up in the criminal justice system. But what I would, what I would push back on a little bit is, is those kids who are caught up in the criminal justice system don't just need detention. I totally oh, no, no, agree no. with Commissioner Baker. What they need are basically the staff who are working at Woodside. Right, right. Because no, those staff yeah. are expert at dealing with kids with behavior problems that aren't so serious that they you know that they're that ill but, right. but need structure. So you know you have a great staff to deal with those kids and, and, and we do need to deal with those kids but and they need therapeutic con you know contact, not just correctional contact. Right, right. No, I, I, I get that, but there are two I think there are two buckets. We have those two buckets. I do agree. Mm -hmm. Is there more to Crawford that we should uh, you said that this is a preliminary injunction. 
It is a preliminary injunction, and, um, and we're still in the middle of the case, and um, we have a status conference coming up on, uh, on Tuesday, and so it's hard to say what's going to happen with the case, but you know, the court ordered these preliminary orders, and so currently um, the conditions at Woodside are much different than they were when we filed the lawsuit. Um, and there's only a couple of kids there, which makes it extremely different than it used to be, and there are new policies and procedures in place, which makes it very safe. What if this ruling, um, one question, and then this ruling was filed 8, 9, 19? August, yeah. August 9, 19. And that's when we saw, started to see the drop in population at Woodside? So what I, what, what I can tell you so, is... So, I mean, it, it has this chilling effect. You, the judge files this report, then the population drops to zero, and the administration's response is close the facility. So that's the administration's response to Judge Crawford, in my opinion. I mean, I, you could look at the population. They were running 15 or 16 last year when, when DCF said, let's um, build a new Woodside. Remember that proposal? Mm -hmm. and, it was out there and there was disagreement. So they were running 15 or 16, so it was figured there'd be 15 kids. You have this suit, um, and Franklin, when we went there and visited there last spring, I had the same reaction, by the way, to much of this. So then they have this suit, the population immediately drops. And they changed the admissions policy, I believe. And they did several other things. And so now we're down, to, if we just talk about DCF kids, we're down to one kid. Mm -hmm. And we've been at zero, we've been at 85. So the time, if you look at the time frame here, that's what changed. It's a good opportunity, Senator. Yeah, I, no, I don't disagree with you, but it's, uh, it's too much coincidence. To not believe that that's why they they changed the, the admissions policy based upon the report. Then the population went down. They then had problems in other places, but so that's where we're at. I think there's a general consensus that we should do something different with our kids with serious mental health needs, and, and DCF is acting towards that goal. Well, that'd be nice if we had the other. So, so let me get this straight in my head, but it is appropriate for the current um, staff and, and maybe even appropriate to keep the, the DOC kids at Woodside while um, figuring out a way to move toward something better, but the current staff is capable of dealing with them and it would not be terrible to keep them at Woodside, the DOC kids, not not the mental health kids, while we move towards something else for that population also, something maybe better. The other bucket of kids need something right away that doesn't exist anywhere right now. In Vermont. In Vermont. Mm -hmm. And and that includes the kids that are being sent to, to 302 or 304, 204, 204. Whatever, whatever number it is. That, a lot of those are inappropriate to be sent there, but they fall in this other bucket that should be, okay. So I haven't All been right. to 204 in a couple of years. I'm only hearing what you're hearing, but the fact that they're saying their restraints against children yeah. have gone up almost 100 and something percent is clear evidence that there's a problem. Right, okay, so I, I get that now. We have these two needs. One could be, um, temp, could march in that direction. The other one, we really need something pretty soon. There's some clear, alternatives. There's clear evidence there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, no. But I don't know what the evidence is, what the problem is. Oh, I'm not, I, I don't know what the problem is. I haven't been down there, uh, Senator, so I would. I know what the problem is. If the kids are placed there appropriately. Right. Well, that's what he said. Because there's no other place. That's what he said. But, but keep in mind that the kids who are causing much of the, the, the restraints were not delinquent kids who would have been at right. Woodside. Exactly. And, and so that's, health. those kids are often sent out of state because they have such right. complex needs and we don't have that capacity here. Exactly. We all agree. And, mm -hmm. and for some of those, the out of state plan and placement is very good for them. Absolutely, very, very the only place. And I'm, I'm not against several. 
I'm certainly not against out-of-state placements. And as, as the federal general says, you know, a lot of places are, are in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, which right. are closer to my house and a lot of places. However, there's a chunk of them who are not close. And, and, yeah. and the question is, why can't we have those programs here if there is such a need? Not all the programs, clearly, but, but some. Yeah. And, and I think uh, Senator White's right, there is a sort of an imperative uh, to do something with these kids who have these trauma histories, these behavioral disorders, who um, we're struggling to figure out what to do with right now, and, and, but who are not at Woodside currently. Uh, and it's not your expertise, you're, you're, you're in a different role. But I will say this, that uh, it isn't going to get better, it's going to get worse. We're seeing kids at an elementary school, first, second grade, being pulled out of the classroom. We in Bennington have just started a, a place for the kids who are yeah. having significant mental health problems. So we'll keep them out of the emergency room. Um, the fact that you need that in Bennington, Vermont, tells me that this isn't going to get better. But that's a great program. It's exactly what we should be doing to divert well, people. I don't disagree, it's but great. It, it tells me that if we don't have unique if we don't change the way we're doing business, the problem's not going to get better. It's going to be worse. And I think we're all moving in that direction. Again, you know, the, what DCF is talking about is, I think, the right science. Um, it's just a matter of how quickly we get there. Yeah. yeah. But many of those kids should be in the Department of Mental Health, not the Department of Children and Families. The silo is, oh, silos have always been a problem. Yeah. Well, it always comes back to money. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the opportunity Thank to talk. You. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you. Hi, this is Erica. Hi, Erica. It's Dick Sears, Senate Judiciary <clears throat> Committee, and uh, a number of people in the room. Um, and uh, we appreciate you taking time away. I know you've got to go to court shortly. So, um, you know, our, we're trying to understand what impact um, the closure of Woodside would have on you because you have one of the programs that gets a lot of the kids who would otherwise go to Woodside at, at 204, 206, 119. And many times the behavior gets out of control. The, the police are called, then they call you as the state's attorney. So maybe you can describe a little bit of what you go through. And I know you supported, always supported the program, so it's not, not what I'm not what we're asking about. We're asking about what the impact would be on you if there wasn't a good stuff. So, um, yeah, the impact has been increasing. Uh, you know, we've had 204, 206, and uh, don't forget we have Bennington School for Girls. So right. the, those are placements for, in the past, it's been for very specific types of um, juveniles that have Bennington docket numbers 
think part of the concern uh, that I've had is twofold. When DCF changed their policy regarding admission to Woodside and required a this statement from DCF, that really tied the hands of law enforcement, uh, particularly after hours, but even during the week, during the you know business day, we were having a uh, some counties um, not as much here, but some counties were having a difficult time getting uh, a certificate from their local DCF person to say yes, this person needs to go to Woodside. So then, just an example, we I reviewed four cases yesterday, four new delinquencies that came in last week. Three of them are for 204, 206, and Bennington School. Two of them are unlawful mischief. One of them is an aggravated assault, and none of those juveniles were put in, uh, could be moved, um, because we're being told that they don't, they either don't qualify to go to Woodside, or there are some other, or they want to leave them there, and so then the criminal justice system is getting in the middle of, you know, what the DCF worker is, uh, position is, and what the residential placement position is, and uh, that's when I get a lot of phone calls, like, what do you want us to do with this kid? And so I think to me, because we are on the opposite end of the state, there have always been some issues with, uh, I'm, I hate using Woodside because it's so far away. So now I have a kid that, you know, has some significant issue at a residential placement, or even if they're not at a residential placement, they're in the home, I need to figure out, is, it, is this a kid that we need to have, you know, shipped eight hours to the other end of the state, and then they have to come back to court, of course, for an emergency hearing, usually the next day or the day after. And so, um, you know, to me, it seems like a simpler, it's always seems like it could be a simple fix just by having some more accessible regional placements for kids. And they need to be two different types of placements. We need to have a place where uh, delinquents, you know, kids that are in custody, juveniles that are in custody, it, it can be that they're an unmanageable or whatever, but once they have a delinquency and a risk of flight or uh, combativeness, um, violence is a concern, those juveniles need to have a place that they can be placed that's secure, that's safe, that, you know, isn't super far away from the workers that will be working with them and the uh, support network that they have. Um, and then we need a separate place for the kids that are mental health or DD kids that pose a risk to themselves or others. And, you know, currently the biggest complaint I'm hearing from some of the local workers and facilities is that these, these juveniles are being mixed together in these programs. And so we had a kid, one of the cases I reviewed recently was, you know, a juvenile that is not a delinquent, but, you know, I think he has some delinquencies, but his primary issue is, has always been mental health. He was so upset because one of the kids at his program ran away. Um, and that he had a pretty significant outburst and did some damage to the property. And, you know, two of the cases that I reviewed last week were for punching holes or kicking holes in walls of the of 204, 206. And it's like, you know, I struggle with bringing those kids back to court because these are kids that are having these kinds of issues. You know, the kids that are at 204, 206 are having some issues either with anger you know, whatever it is, and the idea that we would just repeatedly bring them back to court and file new delinquencies every time they have an outburst, or, you know, the other one that we run in, I see most prevalently are the kids that assault a staff member while they're being restrained, and it's very difficult for me because it's like, well, a staff member has a right to be at work and not be assaulted, but that being said, you know, if you're restraining a kid that has significant issues, and they pull the staff member's hair or they're kicking and fighting to get loose. I mean, I feel like I need to have more options available for what we're doing with um, the kids that are in that situation. Because, I mean, it just makes it really hard for those of us that are doing the, the work 
with the kids that are having difficulties while they're in these the, the placements in Bennington because you know we've already identified them as kids that are having that are having some struggles and so you know I've always I don't know if you were there Senator for the when they did the open house at the park in I did Bennington not, it was and, but, day I was up here so I'm yeah sure. and they and, and I didn't make it either I ran clear from juvenile court but they you know the, it's frustrating because they're you know it's a great model I think to have a local someplace regional uh, I know Rutland is working on the same type of model where they would have a place for kids in crisis um, the problem that we're having with it is at least in Bennington the puck is only for kids 10 and under and it's only uh, as they have it staffed so one of the um, kids that we have that actually was under 10 that needed uh, a secure place to be uh, that was more like a mental health situation uh, they didn't have the staffing to staff the room when we needed it so we had to make um, alternative arrangements and then obviously the kids that are at 204, 206 and Bennington School are not under 10 and we need a place that we can that workers can have kids that are that's going to be safe and secure that's not sitting in a
the kids that are in the residential placements that then can no longer be there. Um, I would have always said that this girl should have gone to Woodside because that's not because I want to punish her, but because it was, yeah. at the time, it was the only care facility of that so kind you're, we had. You're, you're also saying that the Woodside admission policy changed dramatically. Yeah, last, last yeah. Year. in February of 2019, it changed dramatically. And now they did indicate that it had to do with federal funds, um, That, uh, but that's because Woodside was deemed, you know, essentially a psychiatric residential treatment facility. And um, that, that I, you know, I just, look, you know, I've been doing this a long time. And 10 years ago, Woodside, you know, we had various programs at Woodside that we always had a wait list. We had to wait for, to get kids into some of the longer programs, um, you know, the programs that were 18 months or longer. And they had different wings. And when it changed to kind of this, you know, what they're now calling a psychiatric residential treatment facility, I, I just, I don't know that I buy it. I haven't gotten the information because I have yet to see anybody go to Woodside for any kind of longer term psychiatric residential treatment facility. It's really been, so I'm not sure why we have to abide by the federal requirement for that type of facility because I don't look at Woodside as being that. Well, and, and they lost the fund, the federal funding that they were using. They, to, they required that. They required that, and so it's a six million dollar general fund hit, and that's part of the reason why we're here. Yeah, I mean, I you know honestly, I think all I think at least those of us on the southern end of the state, like Wyndham, Rutland, and Bennington, would ab and probably even Windsor would absolutely say, look, having some types of uh, some type of regional facility that has you know a wing for kids that are in mental health crisis and a wing for the kids that are violent and or significant risk of flight. It would be less expensive. It would be beneficial to the kids. They're not spending all their time on the road. It would be better for the social workers, the prosecutors, because we would be closer to the, you know, the juvenile that's placed in those places. You know, they still need to have work with their social worker, have, you know, local supports put in place. I mean, the, cause the goal, obviously, is to get them out of that place. And so the further we put them from, you know, all of their supports and the people they're going to be working and living with, the, the harder it is to make that happen. So, um, you know, I think I think there are a lot of other solutions, but I think we absolutely need to have a place because, you know, we're, we're really struggling with probably, I was trying to get the report, if I talked to the admin here, and we fell in the around probably 40% of all of our new delinquencies in Bennington are coming out of those three locations. Interesting. Well, thank you, Erica. Appreciate it. Any other questions for Erica? No. Thanks no. so much. Helpful. Okay. Thanks, no Erica. Helpful. Bye. Have a good day. Yep. yep. Bye. Thank you. Um, Marshall? Um, Marshall Paul from the Office of the Defender General. Um, I want to start by just sort of observing that there's it doesn't this is a sort of an interesting bit of testimony because it doesn't sound like this is testimony where there's a lot of agreement between people because people have a lot of concerns and people have a lot of different concerns but I think there is actually a lot of agreement here we've heard from uh, really everybody that it's this population of kids with profound mental health needs that are the biggest problem that are the hardest to place and um, you know that's what state's attorney Martha said that's what uh, attorney Rubin said that is absolutely and, and I would fully agree with that that is the most sort of um, confounding population that we deal with it's the population that we deal with that is sort of the um, suffers the most harm, causes the most harm, and is the hardest to find a way to address those harms, both the harms that are caused and the harms that are suffered by those kids. And I think, and I would also agree that there is an absolutely a need for, in this state, a much more well-developed adolescent mental health system. And I would go even further than that and say that as long as we have a not very well-developed system of mental health for kids, pre-adolescent kids, for really young kids, we're going to keep seeing the scale of problems we see in our adolescent kids today. 
That said, um, Woodside is not going to be a piece of that solution in any way, shape, or form, and that has nothing to do. Uh, it, no matter what this committee does or any other committee does, Woodside is not going to be the solution to that. Um, apart from just simply the fact that there's general agreement within our system that Woodside is a really bad place for those kids with those you know, high profound mental health needs, there's also now a court order saying they can't go there. So it, no matter what this body does, Woodside is not going to be the solution to the problem that we are really, that's driving all of these other things that we're talking about. At the core of it is these mental health kids and where they land and the fact that, yeah, oftentimes they land in really inappropriate placements and oftentimes that's for really bad reasons like that we don't have anywhere else to put them. Like, that's the worst situation we can be in is when we walk into a room to talk about why a kid is at Woodside or why a kid is in another high security residential placement and the only response that anybody can give is well we don't have anywhere else to put them I mean that's as you know it's it's the it's our system really admitting that we have a problem that we haven't solved um, whenever we wind up in that situation and it happens far too often so I agree with all of that it's just that to me I don't see any path in which Woodside is really even a factor in that problem anymore, especially given the federal uh, lawsuit holding that they can't, those kids cannot be part of Woodside anymore. So to that end, I think I agree with everyone who's testified that we have a problem and it's a problem that absolutely needs to be addressed um, and it needs to be addressed in an, in an acute manner. Um, and I also think that it's not something that can be addressed by keeping Woodside open longer, opening Woodside to other populations of kids. Anything like that isn't going to address that problem. So then we look at sort of what is the remaining problem, the, the, the kids who are not suffering profound mental health problems that are simply have behavioral health problems that uh, and need to be contained for detention purposes, for uh, treatment purposes in some situations. And is that the place where we need Woodside? And that's the population where, you know, right now we are down to a tiny, tiny, tiny number. And that's not some sort of aberration. That's not inconsistent. That's consistent with, with what's happening in all the states around us. It's consistent with what's happening uh, in states nation uh, nationally. I mean, all over the country, juvenile corrections, juvenile institutionalized populations are not just falling. They're falling almost vertically when you put it into a chart. I mean, it is incredible. Looking at New Hampshire next to us, which has gone from populations in the hundreds to populations in the single digits. Looking at Connecticut that is completely closed. It's only secure uh, commitment center. They still do, um, because of the way they have their system structured, they still do secure detention, but that's not done on a statewide basis. That's done regionally all over the place. But they closed their, they closed the training school, which was their last secure juvenile commitment facility. Uh, New York City, which closed back in the, they were the sort of ahead of the curve on this, they closed all of their big juvenile upstate facilities uh, that New York City used back in the like 2003, 2004, 2005 range, brought those kids back into the city, into smaller facilities scattered around the boroughs, and they've dropped their population that's in secure detention, so this is Unlike Connecticut, which dealt with the commitment end, but not the detention end. New York City dealt with the detention end, but not the commitment end. Um, their kids in detention, they were down to 12 the other day. Uh, and that's in a city of 8.9 million people. So this is really reflective of what's happening everywhere. And you see that when you look at rates of youth crime. And when you, uh, you know, I've heard some people speculate that that's because we're not prosecuting youth crime or, um, you know, really looking for treating youth crime in the same way that we used to. Some of which is true, some of which is just that we've changed how, you know, this current generation of kids who are in their adolescence now, I was looking at the results from the most recent uh, youth risk behavior survey, which is sort of the best data we have to go on tracking behaviors rather than charges or convictions. Um, and just looking at where it was 
12 years ago, you know, the number of kids who by the by ninth grade had tried alcohol was cut more than in half. It was up near 70% 12 years ago. It's under 40% now. The kids who had tried smoking cigarettes was cut almost as much. The number of kids who had had sex by ninth grade was cut dramatically. I mean, it is the, the only line that I saw when you put all of the youth behavior survey uh, indicators, all the ones that I liked, on one graph, the only line that was going up was the amount of video, uh, kids who reported playing three or more hours of video games a day went up. Every other line just plummets. Um, and you see that in rates of youth violent crime. You see that in rates of youth property crime. I mean, we are in a an era where we have just seen this all taper off to nearly, the, to numbers we've never seen before. And that's really reflective of the fact that we've changed how we treat kids. And that's, um, you know, when you look at the history of Woodside, one of the things that we never talk about, uh, we, you know, we talk a lot about the history of Woodside, how it's changed over the years, the changes in its purpose, the changes in its population, the changes in it, the sort of scope of services it provides. One of the big events that we never talk about is the development of functional MRIs in the 90s um, and how that led us, you know, when they opened Woodside, their, the best scientific evidence was that kids' brains were fully developed by about age 10. We could look at people people's brains um, in an MRI machine, but only statically. We could look at a snapshot of what their brain was doing. We couldn't watch it while they processed information. And because of that, the only information we had about like, how does the brain develop is its size. And it reaches full size at about age 10. And the idea was, well, after that, it's all just learning. You learn how to how to be a better person, you learn this stuff, and when kids are behaving badly, it's because they're behaving badly or learning badly. Um, and it was only in the 90s that we discovered, uh, because they invented these functional MRIs where you could watch in real time somebody's brain process a question. And we discovered that kids and uh, adolescents up to age 24, 25, 26, depending on whether you're talking about men or women, process like children all the way up to that point. Um, and that kids and adults are actually processing things totally different and that some of the some of the issues that we see as being like the real um, the real factors in driving juvenile crime, decisions about risk taking, decisions about uh, when to sort of uh, resist the influence of your peers, that when kids process those things, it takes them five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times as long to process as adults because they use a completely different part of their brain to process it than adults use. Um, so really, and that, that research that happened changed how we treat <coughs> adolescent offenders. Um, it changed, and you saw it in what happened at Woodside. I mean, it's no, it's not any coincidence that it was in the sort of early to mid 2000s that Woodside saw this shift into providing more treatment, doing more in the in the vein of mental health treatment rather than simply sort of containing kids. That's because there was so much learning going on about how kids actually develop and what they need in order to be treated. And that's what, you know, honestly, that's what's driven this, you know, not just Vermont, but nationwide decarceration of children has been this new understanding. And, and it's more effective. We're more effective at treating kids than we used to be, we're, that, which means we're more effective at keeping kids out of jail. And it also means kids are just committing less crimes in the first place because now we know a lot of what leads kids into that is not just bad thinking. It's actually these sort of psychobiological or psycho, that was a bad word, that wasn't quite the right word, but these sort of, um, you know, essentially uh, brain development issues that, that are really driving that pattern of offending. So, um, and then the other point that I'd like to make is just that um, I think there's been a lot of look as if there's been some triggering event that has resulted in the serious decrease in population at Woodside. And I think that that's only partially true. I think what there really is is layers and layers and layers of events that have changed the population of Woodside. When I started 10 years ago dealing with Woodside, it was not uncommon for Woodside to be up near 30 kids. Um, they would go over 30 kids and they would have to take kids because they were statutorily capped at 30. They'd have to take kids to a hotel um, and keep some of them there. It was that crowded. And it's not just like last year that the population plummeted or the year before that. It's been dropping and dropping and dropping stage by stage by stage for years and years and years. Um, and 
I think that it's absolutely accurate to say that there's a bunch of things that have happened in the last couple of years that have um, increased that decarceration. Um, but I don't think it's accurate to say that it, those events are the only factors that have caused it. it it's really been on this trajectory for quite a while. And yes, there's been events in the last year or two that have kept it on that trajectory, um, but it's been on that trajectory for a while. But a year ago, the administration plan was to open a 30-bed program uh, at Woodside for both seriously mentally ill kids as well as the traditional delinquent kids. So then, you know, you, I mean, it's, we were talking about that about a year ago this time. So a lot changed in a year, and, and the, the, the problems with that seriously emotionally disturbed kids or mentally ill kids are still there. And if I would argue that it's even been exasperated. Um, so you know, for me, at this point, I'm considering that this committee would recommend that you keep Woodside open until uh, there's available community placements. I, would, I, I just don't see how you can close Woodside until you can actually show us that you can handle that group in the community. Secondly, um, I, I, you know, the, the community, I mean, I'm hearing from the state attorney in Bennington, but I don't think she's going to be the only one. If you close Woodside, I don't think the communities are ready for the behavior if the administration isn't ready to have a places that those kids can be held. I think we'll get a huge outcry from our communities, we as senators and representatives. I would disagree, Senator Sears, only because it's already happened. Those seriously mentally ill kids, seriously behaviorally disturbed kids that you're talking about are not going to Woodside right now. Um, so that's already happened. No, and, and, and that's under the terms of a court nobody, order. So nobody so, play, but nobody has put the resources behind those kids. I understand that. And, and that's what, I, I mean, I'll tell you, I agree completely with State's Attorney Marthage that the best solution here is to have what I'm, what I'm hoping and what I'm actually expecting to be the result of this RFP process is that there are proposals to scatter highly secure beds around the state. That it is. mentally, for the kids with mental illness, or for the DOC well, kids, because we're talking about two buckets here. We are talking about two buckets. We're not, when we're talking about the seriously mentally ill kids, we're not talking about kids who need to get out of Woodside and into something else before Woodside closes, because they're already not in Woodside. Right, so they're inappropriately placed. I think a lot of them are inappropriately placed. I don't think that's a, a, a problem that solution is, uh, that Woodside is either the solution no. for or anything else. It, it's already been, walled off from that population. So keeping Woodside open doesn't solve anything for those kids. Those kids don't, they're not gonna go to Woodside. Um, they're not gonna go to Woodside if Woodside stays open. They're not gonna go to Woodside if Woodside closes. It's not gonna address that population. Um, I agree that we have a lot of needs that we need to serve and I wanna- But, but I'd, like to, I'd like to close it on the 1st of July, but I don't think the state is ready to close it on the 1st of July. There is not a plan that I can see that is viable at this point. And I agree that there are fewer kids, and it may be down to one or two, but those one or two can present some significant problems. And I'm uh, and I, so I, I think that they, they, the agency, should come back to both justice oversight and joint fiscal before they, with a plan to deal with both population before they close. And this is really testimony for DCF, but my understanding is that the RFPs either come in this week or next week. It's sometime real soon. Well, they're due the 28th. We, we, we're making a final decision on this. Um, hopefully, the week we get back from town meeting and put this into that bill. But I, right now, I'm giving you what I'm suggesting is that we require the administration to have a viable plan that's presented to both Justice Oversight and Joint Fiscal for approval before they close or wait until we get back here next January, or we here will never get in, that the adolescent mental health policies need to be addressed. I don't, I don't think they're addressing them. I agree with you, but I don't think that keeping Woodside open has anything to do with adolescent mental health at this point. Saying, but, but 
you have behavioral health issues that aren't being addressed. Mm -hmm. And those are different than the that, mental health. I mean, I think that's, that's, I, I agree that they're different. Um, sometimes it's, it's hard to tell the difference because mm -hmm. the kid acts out in a, in a violent way and, and may destroy pro property in that, which I would differ from, from you know, the kid that um, kicked or punched like couldn't get what what uh, Erica was whether the kid was kicking or punching the wall and did damage. And I'm not sure that's a delinquent problem as much as a mental health problem. But you know, there's certainly assaulting staff, and those types of things should be dealt with as delinquencies. Um, you know, if there were any adults it would be. You know, I mean I think it depends on the context. I agree with you in principle. Anyway, I that's, think that that's what I'm hope you know, I hope that the the committee will be wrestling with when we get back to town meeting. So I don't, I don't think we're disagreeing. But to keep this idea and to keep the funding at Woodside going as if they had that population that they don't have anymore. And that I think is the issue for That's me is that in order to solve this sense to me. in order to solve this problem, what we need is we need adolescent mental health placements that are serious, that are available, that are effective, and we're gonna need funds to do that. And um, Honestly, I think that Woodside right now is costing a lot of, it's costing way more money than it is providing value to our system. Um, and we have real needs right now I'm for other types of resources and other placements. I don't think the, I, you know, I don't think the magic that they're expecting from the RFP is going to show up. Well, see, I'm hopeful that it will. I'm always hoping for magic. Yeah. So my understanding is that the RFPs are for this seriously like mental health. Ill. No. No. It's for both. I think that would be a oh, level. Okay. Clarify for. Or is, is it for both? It's for. You both. Identify yourself. Leslie Wisdom from DCF. So the RFP um, requests responses from a wide variety of needs, including seriously mental Ill, Ill as well as behavioral health needs. As well as behavioral health needs. But. Also, the DOC are they considered the behavioral no. health? I, I, I'm, I'm, DOC will have a problem okay, when I, they close Woodside. Right, I'm I'm stuck into AJ's two buckets here, and there's three. I, well, there's behavioral health needs that aren't as serious as the seriously mental health, and they need treatment. That's true, but I'm so the if. If all of the going to bucket number one, which is but I forgot which is bucket number one. No, this is a test. Which is bucket <laughs> number one? <laughs> bucket number one is the kids that are under DOC. Oh, okay. Okay. Certainly. And they they don't necessarily have serious mental health issues. Mm -hmm. They have behavioral health need, and they need more than just being locked up. If that population is decreasing all kind of across the country and we need some place for those kids that is just that's more than just locking them up i mean they need programming and they need uh, actually so yep go ahead they and um so this is kind of two-pronged question what types of uh, so what, how, how does Connecticut and New York, if their population has gone way down, we know that New Hampshire is still housing people at the 100 faci bed facility. If we have, um, if, if it's going down and everybody kind of is seeing this happen, it seems to me that if you, if you have five or seven kids in a year and you have two or three of them at any time, that putting those kids in what would seem somewhat isolation with two or three kids, you, you can't provide the kinds of services that they need. Why, why wouldn't we, and I know that people can't stand the idea of um, going out of state, but I have to tell you that um, most of New Hampshire and Maine and New York are closer to Vermont than if you live in Montana. It, Mm -hmm. It's one state. So why can't we think about that that population that is under DOC? 
of having some kind of a regional facility that really would provide the kinds of services and instead of so that you have you have a number that's big enough to be able to provide the services and 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 treat them let me so a couple of things first off uh, when you get to doc there's some there's some issues with that population that's a little different than with TCF population. Right, right. I'm talking and, and about specifically, them different. Yeah, and specifically, what I'm getting at is that um, there's a lot of there's a lot of situations in which you cannot really provide treatment to those kids early in their case. You cannot do it while they are being detained, um, and that's because kids who are DOC who are that young and need to be locked up are almost always charged with something very serious, and their lawyer is 100% of the time going to say, nobody talks to my kid until this trial is over. And as long as they are facing serious adult charges, that's the right thing to do. Um, and that means they're not going to be receiving treatment in a really effective way until after their trial is over. And so most of the programs that provide secure detention for kids with adult charges not just in Vermont, but anywhere else, they're not providing much in the way of treatment. They provide basic services. They don't provide anything detailed that's in because- That's detention. Right. How about after they're adjudicated? And that's where I would say in Vermont, it is very, very rare for us to have someone who is under the age of 18, who is sentenced to an incarcerative sentence right. as an adult. Um, I don't, we have none at this point right now in Vermont. Um, the two people that we have at Woodside right now are both detention. They are not uh, sentenced. Um, so we have zero right now in Vermont, and that's typical. We typically have zero. So they 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 haven't even had their trials yet. No, those? no that's that, that's part of the problem. Um, is, okay. is that you know we we sit here and I realize it's only two kids, but it'll be corrections problem because they'll have to provide a motel room and two guards, twenty four seven, three shifts a day. <coughs> Um, to watch that person, That's and, and it's a huge expense to the taxpayer of the state of Vermont who doesn't understand why we're doing this, and then we get the crap for it, and, you know, because if you close the woodside, that's what's going to happen. They got no choice. I mean, they could put the 16-year-old at, at uh, Marble Valley, I guess, but, there's other choices, and I think that um, the DOC could continue to have a memorandum of understanding with DCF and continue to use DCF's highly secure placements, which I am certain will exist after the RFP process, um, to hold kids who are, and that's actually. I wish you had more faith. I wish I had more faith in the RFP than. That. Well, and we'll we'll see yeah. next week. I mean, and maybe I'll come back. Hopeful to certain. Maybe I'll come back next week. I I am fairly certain, given some of the people I've talked to around the state who may be involved in this. Um, I'm, I shouldn't say certain. I should say fairly certain, at best. Um, but so fairly certain that there will be solutions to this and that uh, and let me just add one other thing which is one of the things they do in New York City in their close to home program that I really like it addresses a lot of what you're talking about with that population of kids so they have a lot of uh, in, in the boroughs they have a lot of what were originally small secure facilities that have turned into because of the decrease in the population of kids in New York who need the secure facilities to uh, staff secure facilities, meaning you know, awake overnight staff, but with one or two hardware secure beds in them. So one or two that are really more like a cell. And those kids who are in that, in those more secure areas of the facility, may be able to participate with the rest of the kids in what goes on in the less secure parts of the facility, or may be more restricted to the secure parts depending on their behavior and on their conduct. And that is exactly a way to meet the needs that you're talking about, where you are providing that high security, but also uh, getting kids into an environment where they can get that treatment, where they can get those needs served. That, um, wouldn't, uh, that wouldn't serve the kids who are in detention, though, because they can't talk to anybody. Well, and you know, it's not that they can't talk to anybody. It's that they can't engage in the kind of serious mental health treatment that oftentimes they really need, where you sit down and talk about all the things you've done and right. why you okay. did those things. Um, they can have their immediate they can get mental math health. Classes and you can whatever. get you can get education. You can get sort okay. of immediate acute mental health treatment. What you can't do is have people sitting down with those kids saying, "Let's explore your past. Right. Let's explore right. the things you've I done and why that. you've done them." Okay. 
it makes it very difficult. That's all. Thank you. Hello, this is Jeff. Hi, Jim. This is Dick Sears and the Senate Judiciary Committee, as well as several other people in the room. And I'm curious. Uh, I don't. We don't really have a model. Huh? Are you there? Yep. Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you have any new news to add to? Um, we just talked to Erica Massage, and uh, you know, it's it's. I think that. We're, we also have heard from A.J. Rubin, who's with the uh, Disability Rights Group, that uh, the, the, the suit regarding um, Woodside and Judge Crawford's decision and uh, Marshall Paul from the Defender General's office uh, in Erica. And I'm curious about if you look back at the uh, restraints issue, um, regarding uh, the number of delinquent kids who have been restrained versus kids who are not delinquent that have been placed at 204 or 206 or 119. Yeah, the number, the number is higher on the non-delinquent kids, the trans young manageables. And somebody said the majority of, your, of the restraints were three or four kids. Yeah. The, um, uh, up over just a hair over half made up four individuals. Three of them, three of them male, one female, and the female number? was was a delinquent. The three males were not. Interesting. Have the number of have you been having additional problems related to admission to Woodside? No specific uh, issues lately. No. Have you been asking for admissions to Woodside lately? No. Okay. Well, then you wouldn't have to. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Um, are there, I, and I don't want to take a lot of time away from you, Jim, but are there, are there thoughts that you have about um, the position you're being placed in? Yeah, and we'll, we'll be we'll be putting some things together to send out, you know, looking for some some help in regards to some financial aspects so that we can do um, more uh, have some more staff. Um, we had there was some uh, a complaint filed against us from a resident um, who was uh, removed from our program and admitted to Woodside uh, maybe, maybe about two weeks ago, um, and he had talked to licensing. Um, we have some concerns, um, and based on uh, our licensing discussions, um, they have put forth some recommendations um, on some of our staffing that we're going to be looking to and put together some numbers and you know looking to get some uh, some help with as we add those. Licensing recommends that you increase staff. Well, uh, well I guess. It's they, they, can, they can put out recommendations, and that is basically we have to see what we can do in regards to those um, versus, you know, like a violation and mandating that we have to do some things. So they can, uh, we, you know, we can have that discussion, um, but I don't think they can come to us and say, you got to have more staff, and then we have to turn around and go to the state saying, well, based on license, we have to have more staff. I think it's something that they put out there that we have to, you know, we can use that as you know as the recommendation, but we still have to go through the whole process. The licensors work for DCF, correct? Yes. Other questions for Jim? We appreciate what you're doing there. It's a great deal. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate that. I really don't have many questions today, Jim. I think you know, we, we pretty much got most of our information last week. Um, I hope that, you know, you guys will hang in there. Um, there's a lot changing, and I know it's always difficult when you don't feel like you're getting the level of support you need. Yeah, I guess some are, I mean, I'm not I'm sure if I ever stated our overall view, but I definitely think that there needs to be something, and I don't even like the word, um, you know, Woodside is that 
because Woodside, you know, has kind of like a definition already, you know, tagged with it, and, I, and I'm not saying that in any negative context. So what I think um, we need moving forward is we do need a place, you know, maybe it's a five to ten bed place where we can send the real difficult kids um, with the significant um, charges, you know, whether it's um, aggressiveness or murders or anything along those lines, um, but also have the opportunity to put some of the more difficult behaving kids who are not delinquents in there as well. Maybe it's for a timeout, maybe it's for, you know, similar to what I like, you know, within eight days they have to, you know, be reevaluated kind of thing. But there definitely needs to be some place um, where the most difficult kids can go as well as some of the more challenging behaviors. Great. Great. Thank you, Jim. All right, thank you for the opportunity. Thank yeah, you, Jim. see you next week. All right, thank you. Thanks, Adam. All right, Good morning, I'm Alex Hodgins from Woodside. All right, Matt Ness here at Woodside. Yep, good to see you here. Always. Uh, first off, I would just like to say that um, Woodside in and of itself gets wrapped up in um, a lot of negative, negative conversations, and I would just like to separate Woodside as the facility and the staff that work there from the policies that oversee what it is that we do there. Um, those, those individuals that operate outside of the policies put forward by the department are held accountable for acting outside of the policies put forth by the department. Um, but however, Woodside being held accountable for shortcomings of the department's policies is, is getting a little out of control in my opinion. Yeah, but in this decision, I, I think the part of the finding was that the policies themselves are wrong. That's that's what I'm saying. Oh, I, I the thought department, you were, the, de the department is who generates the policy. I thought you were saying that staff who went outside the policies were bad apples, but here the, the barrel is bad. What I'm saying is that uh, any time throughout the course, I've been there for 14 years, any time throughout the course of my time at Woodside, when somebody has operated outside of the practice, acceptable policies at Woodside set forth by the department, they're held accountable for those. That was a statement in and of itself, not referring yeah. specifically to the okay. litigation. Because what, what I thought was eye-opening here was the judge pointing to the policies themselves. Correct. And then saying there is no policy currently. I, he says I can't see a policy, but over the course of these next number of hearings, I'm confident one will shape up that will be able to pass constitutional muster, that's a pretty startling statement to say not only aren't there policies in place that are constitutionally um, valid, but one is going to shape up over a number of weeks. That's a pretty chaotic description well, of what's going on. I think if, if the, the policies have changed, so you know, the numbers at Woodside have dropped because the policies have changed, but there hasn't been a replacement. So you're seeing the strains in the system and all these different programs we've been hearing about for the past few weeks, they're saying there's still a need. So just because there's, there's less people at Woodside doesn't mean there's a need. In fact, there's more of a need because now Woodside is not an option. Mm -hmm. And that's the main well, change. The policies change because for a number of reasons, not the least of which is Judge Crawford's rulings. But so the admissions policy changed. I don't know if internal policies change. That would side in terms of restraint and other things. But there were policy changes and before that rule. There were policy changes that Erica had mentioned earlier that started in February 2019. There are policy changes that were from July 2018 before these rules. So these policies have changed over the period of a couple of years. Which as policies are you talking about? There's a confusion here about the okay, two so July different 1st, sets of policies. Well, the main, the, internal the, policies the, on I, behavior. The policies regarding admissions. That's what I don't understand. Okay, so those 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 things seem to be affecting population. So I had so a year ago we were talking about a, a thirty bed facility. Here's a handout. Today we're talking about a zero bed facility. So I yeah. I'm so trying to understand there, there, uh, the policy there. There's that several talking. policies. July first, two thousand eighteen, legislative change impacting youth administrative placement. And this answers the question that you, you, had, you had asked us to come here with. Why has there been a decline in population? I would call it a rapid recent decline in population at Woodside. 
Number one is because they're being placed elsewhere. The changes in policy July 1st, 2018, administrative authority limited to post adjudication youth. That's a July 1st, 2018. RSLI standard 508 shall accept and serve only children and youth whose needs can be met by services provided by the program. Woodside policy 301, this is more recent. Intake and screening, uh, screening statement. We do not, Woodside does not have the clinical resources and expertise to serve. So these are the policy changes. It's not just most recently, but, and then Erica had mentioned something in February 2019. I'm not sure what she was referring to. I've also heard July 2019, and I'm not sure what specifically that is, but there's a variety of policies that have changed over the period of a couple of years. And Erica did mention this one to two year period that they've seen these kinds of changes in 204, 206, and Benning School for Girls. We heard at the Howard Center, they've been going through a lot of strains in their system. We've heard from Beckett, who says we definitely need a place of last resort, as they called it. The sheriffs have been here testifying, saying they need it. The people who work at DCF, the uh, emergency service placement after hours, and the social workers. We've heard it from uh, anecdotally from hospitals as well, waiting lists of people waiting to be placed in hospitals. Now, I understand the mental health issue that this case brought up specifically, and that I think it makes sense that you don't want to place mental health kids in a place like Woodside. You need an option. But what we're hearing over and over again is there's no other option. So until there's no other option, I, we got to remain open to, to keep kids safe, keep staff safe, keep the community safe until something else comes along. But I don't see anything coming along. That's my point. Well, the miracle will occur on ice. February 28th. <laughs> Today. All right, peace are open. That's right. But even if the RFPs are open on February 28th, there's not going to be anything ready by July. Well, so when you have a girl that stays in a hospital for 28 days, that's a huge problem because we're not ready for well, it. I'm not, sure not ready for I'm, it. I'm not sure she would have been eligible for Woodside. Well, I, 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 see, I, I think I may be going outside here a little bit, but again, I understand well, Woodside should not be yeah. taking mental health, but if you stop, if, if you say no to Woodside for mental health and you don't have a better replacement, yeah. then you're going to have the scenarios that we just heard about. Yeah. Judge Crawford did. Uh, am, am I reading that wrong? He did what? Did what? Basically said no to the mental health. Yeah, correct. Without saying yes to something else. That, that's a huge but, problem. I agree, but that's what judges do. Right. Which yeah, I think is why when, if we look back. They don't, have a prob they don't have a problem telling you no, and they right. don't have a problem. And then they don't I have just a hope somebody. I, I, I just hope we don't hear about some something in the community right. because and then people say, well, why wasn't, why did they, why did they close this, not have something else, and then someone gets hurt significantly in the community? What I think AJ and Marshall were pointing to is they did close Woodside effectively to that for a certain yes. population. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's yep. what I was hearing, and that's part of the reason that you're down to one, two, three kids who are DCF kids. Right. And the other he, for a moment. Let me just finish. So I'm trying to understand if I'm correct. What Marshall and, and AJ were saying was some of the kids who used to be placed at Woodside with significant mental health issues are not going there, but yet you still have right. you still have the staff who are equipped to deal with that population, but they're not getting that population. So I think what the and I could be wrong in my interpretation of it, but the ruling that, that uh, Judge Crawford came up with is not to say that a youth will never be placed on the grounds at 26 Woodside Drive again. Uh, I believe what it, what it constitutes is that a youth cannot go into that, a mental health youth cannot go into that facility as currently staffed, as currently, uh, as currently outlined in policy. Yeah. So, if policies, the same thing. If, I mean, yeah. therefore, if policies were to change regarding how Woodside was operated, then it, it could be open again to those. Yeah, I, don't, I haven't seen a proposal from the administration. So, that. one of the proposals that we, as the, uh, as the staff at Woodside and the VSA was in support of last year, was a campus-style uh, format with, with pods with different levels of security and different treatment modalities in each pod. Uh, which would take care of a lot of the siloing effect that I think we've, we've all acknowledged is a problem right now. Um, I think it's concerning that the department's 
direction right now is to strictly put out an RFP for services that are currently uh, implemented instead of looking at new services that fill in the gaps of what's out there. What's out there right now is a mental health system that is deteriorating and a juvenile system, a juvenile system that's deteriorating. And if you merge those two and get out of that silo capacity, then you could build a campus where both mental health services and juvenile services, uh, delinquent services, could be implemented. Um, to say that mental health kids need to be around only other mental health kids is, is short-sighted. There's often times where the kids that we've had historically at Woodside who suffer from uh, mental health issues, some of the, the best moments that they have are when they're around other, other kids. Uh, so to just isolate them and you know silo them off to, the, to their own is, isn't self-serving. Uh, I think if we look at it with a, uh, with a broader scope and see how can we use our resources to impact the most youth that we have, we're admitting that the mental health system is jacked up, and we're admitting that the juvenile, uh, juvenile justice system is a little jacked up right at the moment. How can we collaborate services to provide the best service for the Vermont, for the kids of Vermont? And as, as we've stated before, there's, there's behavioral concerns that come up in hospitalization when kids are in a hospital setting where uh, those, those staff and those facilities are not equipped to handle that le level of behavior. And then contingent to that, there's mental health issues that arise in a behavioral setting like Woodside that we don't have the capacity to handle. Whereas if we collaborated more and we got out of this like one department and the other and merged some services that we could, you know, have a collaborative care uh, system of care that, that's actually served the kids of Vermont instead of just silos them. Yeah, no, I'm looking at the in-state, out-of-state residential count. 2019, there were DMH had 67 kids in-state and 45 out-of-state. Dale had two kids out-of-state, none in-state. DCF had 157 kids in-state and 93 out-of-state. In, in the last two years. 2019, and uh, in residential. So, it's a, you know, between the three apartments, <coughs> Dale being uh, only two, so that, you know, really is DMH and, and DCF. Well, you also look at the DOC I population. Get out my calculator, but the DOC population that we're serving there, it, I think it's a little um, short-sighted to also say that those are just behavioral concerns, because a lot of the kids that we have that come through the DOC have extensive trauma histories that they're working through and would and greatly benefit that from. That may be, but they, they obviously come in as pretty serious. Correct, correct. But I, I, I agree that Woodside is a proper placement for those kids. The question is, what happens to them if Woodside closes? Right. And the Commissioner of Corrections said they'd go to a motel room. Correct. I just wanted to hand out a few. There was a couple of things I heard last time about Woodside Building itself. We took some pictures around the facility along with kept, you know, talking about the increased uh, changes to our programming and to the building itself. It's been signed off as structurally sound by VGS. And we took some pictures of the different places. We have added calming rooms and wellness centers. They have an incredible nursing station. They have the, probably the best teen library in the state with over 3,000 of the most up-to-date teen books. Uh, and a, a gym that, if you look at the pictures, it's quite a, a facility, the weight room. It's got a lot of things that is, that is well used by the residents there. Um, the kitchen, uh, the last two years, the, the Department of Health has given the kitchen a, a 98 and 100, which is you know, unbelievable numbers for the Department of Health to hand out to kitchens. So we, we have an incredible cook there. Um, so that, that's one thing I wanted to hand out. And I also wanted to hand out some resident testimonies because I did hear a little bit about that last time we've had. We've tried to collect this kind of hastily. But uh, these are testimonies from ex-residents that have said things like Woodside has saved their lives. And just a lot of different letters that, that have been written to us. 
Um, so I did, I did want to hand those out in, in defense of some of the things that I've heard uh, recently as reasons to close Woodside. We have a great building. It's well used. It's got facilities that a lot of other programs around the state do not have. And uh, we have an education system there that, that is, is unmatched, I think, by a lot of programs as well. And we have a lot of residents that have enjoyed being there. You know, they, you don't want them to be there, you know, but while they've been there, they've actually, there's a lot of laughing that goes on at Woodside. There's, there's a lot of uh, good times inside the building and, and we try to help them um, get to, so they don't have to be there. We don't want I, anyone to be there. Hold on just a second. I don't want to buy with anyone. These kids so. Yeah, these have all been cleared. These have all been cleared. The names have been cleared. It's been I've been authorized to be able to hang, hand them out. Right, right. Police. Right, right. I mean, this is public. Right. By the kids. Right. Yeah, by the kids. The kids, kids. Yep. The kids have signed off it. Yeah. The I'm a little troubled with that. I won't post it. But Marshall, can you give us some advice? <laughs> no. Uh, no, you won't. I can't in this situation. Remember those kids. Uh, I would like a copy so, of the yeah, here you go. Be passed around. I, I just, I'm, a, I'm fearful that the name shouldn't be out there that yeah. these are kids that were at Woodside. But I'm not sure what the rules are. Definitely don't post. So, Leslie yeah. Wisdom from BCF, I would maybe like that not to be passed out until I had a chance to look at it. Oh, okay. have you well, do you have one yeah. that would be? It's not the, the information, it's the last names being available. Yeah, I, I, I was told that it was, it was okay to hand them out, but I don't have the details, so if you'd like to you have, have these, you can. Well, yeah, why doesn't Leslie have stuff one? Stuff is posted on our website there. Where's that? that where, where's that? She, that she has one. Where's the pile? Well, there. There, the pile yeah, was... Right here. Yeah. No, the pile the is... pile of the kids' comments. It looks like this. The, the, the kids' comments, uh, the yeah, cover sheet looks like this. Yes, the yeah, pile. The yeah, I know, the I know, I know. I know. There's a different one. Yes. There's a different one. There's three. There's three of them. Yeah. What? I won't post, but I'll keep a copy of this for our guys. Well, the question is, can we even do that? I mean, I've tried to, over the years, be fairly careful about identifying kids that are in programs, even as adults. So there are confidentiality laws about giving publicity to any youth who have been a part of the delinquency system, including being placed at Woodside. There's a process for all the parties in a case to sign off on disclosure. I'm not sure that process was followed, which I, I'm not okay. faulting you guys at all. I just want to be really careful to protect their identity. I think we're going to hand these to Peggy until we get some kind of a ruling. She will keep them under and then either have them shredded or whatever. Can you find to those? I, your point is that there's a lot of kids who've been at Woodside and feel that they were treated well. In the yes, it's been a positive experience by for hundreds of years. I, we have some it, testimonies. It's only the last names that I'm concerned with, and maybe they can get redacted. So the context of that was that these were kids that came to no, us. I appreciate that. To, to ask what they could do to make sure that they their voices were heard. I'm just concerned. Is this a public meeting? That yes. Being Absolutely. Filmed, and I don't want to violate the law here. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> That's okay. Because I don't yeah, know. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry, I, I no. don't know. No, no, uh, I should have uh, gone through the proper channels. Uh, I thought it was clear, but it may not be. But anyway, uh, the point well taken is that our kids should benefit from what's out of the years, and I know that. And that's it. A question. Um, And, and you had asked the question. How many staff are left? Is there enough that you had a size if you were back to 15? Yes, at this point, I think we, you know, there's been, it's hard to know exactly because we do hear people getting new jobs all the time, but I would say around five staff that I know of have gotten new jobs and moved on and they've been, people have been relocated. But you know, if, it, if, if the, the capacity changed, we could get people to, to, to staff the facility. So as of, as of current, we're not filling any vacancies 
as, as they arise. So today is actually my last day working for the state of Vermont in this capacity. I, I, you know, I have a family to support and I can't sit through all the uncertainty yeah. that's uh, being provided by the department and the, and the, the process. So uh, I need to ensure that my family's taken care of and I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be stepping into that role in my position at Woodside as the, as the clinical care coordinator is gonna be dissolved into uh, other, other staff that are currently are already employed there. Can I ask well, what you'll be moving to in the way of work? Um, in, in light of the, uh, the overall lack of leadership that I've seen from, uh, from the department, I've um, just broken ties completely with the state of Vermont. I'm going to be going to sell insurance. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. So hmm. very difficult decision uh, to leave Woodside. I've been there for 14 years. I grew up in that facility. Uh, we've at every, at every point since I began working there with, with staff that have, you know, 30 plus years of tenure and uh, and countless ex you know life experiences and inexperiences within the state in this population uh, to becoming one of the senior staff in the in the facility we have uh, in my opinion handled ourselves as as best as can be expected with the uh, with the limited uh, leadership that I've seen from the department. Um, in informal discussions, I've heard that the plan for the Woodside property is to tear down the building and uh, uh, have it turned over to the Department of Mental Health by, uh, that, that came from two commissioners, um, D, DMH and uh, extra schools. And BGS, building but if, if we put all this money into this building, I mean, is the building itself really so bad that can it be repurposed? If, even the if building, according to BGS, is structurally sound. And we have um, it, 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 telling you what the administration. We put yeah. eight hundred thousand. Uh, actually, how much money we put in? Uh, I put in uh, six, maybe six hundred thousand dollars. Yep. The problem that occurred is that it's a cement year. building uh, yeah. with fences that look uh, yeah. correctional. Uh, so, and you know, instead of instead of repurposing what they've had there, the plan is you know then to to say that it's a it's a facility out of repair. Um, I think it's a misrepresentation. Some of the things could be updated. Um, 30, 35 year old building is uh, it's not that old in the grand scheme of things. We're in one that's considerably older that seems to be managing just. Could it be a correctional facility? Yeah, the, what you had mentioned earlier about a therapeutic prison for young offenders, I think, is is an option for Woodside. It would be interesting to hear what the number was. Uh, I think it was James Baker was looking into that number for uh, what, how many youth are in, currently in prison that are, that are between 18 and 21. We could serve that population if there's an adequate number. That would be a good use of the building. The facility is uh, able to support that. The staff are trained for this type of youth. Uh, we're familiar with it. Um, so it, it, this is on the back side of uh, what I had handed out earlier, that, that, we can, that we can do that. And I also think that it would be something the department would have a hard time fighting, considering the um, their statements over the last several months that the facility looks too prison-like to to operate in the capacity that it's currently being, currently being asked to. They would have a hard time saying that it couldn't act as a prison in that in that sense. Yeah, I think it's wor I think it's <laughs> yeah. worth it yeah. giving some time to to see what is going to happen if. What, you know, if the current numbers at Woodside remain low, what's going to happen in all these placements? We're seeing some of this, and I do. I emphasized last time, spring's coming. Um, it, it, it is a busy time of the year for us, and I think in the in the state in general. So, you know, leaving Woodside is an option. Look, revisiting some of those policies to allow more residents to come to Woodside, you know, especially the ones that you're hearing about from different placements that they would rather these people come to Woodside. Um, I think it's important to look at that. Okay. Any other questions? I, I'm wondering, does anybody know what happened with the meeting that was happening last week between mental health and DCF and that whole gang with regard to speaking to each other about Woodside and, you know, the um, Sarah Squirrel and others who were meeting last week, allegedly? They said they were. I met with after the that, three commissioners. After that meeting? meeting? After their I don't own know if it was after or before that I had a meeting with them. Um, just to understand the... This week? Last week. I had a meeting with them about the, you know, the presidential numbers. 
I mean, they were talking about whether Sarah, you know, whether they're going to do that. I had a meeting with them, and they, they handed out this report, and they have the system of care report, um, the interagency team, and uh, what's her name? I think they're meeting Tuesday. I keep, I keep getting more information than I need. Um, do they agree as to what they want to do with the building, even? I mean, the whole thing. Do they? Is there any agreement in any place? All I can tell you is what I just said about yeah. the mental health. That they're, they're going to tear the building down and do. It, it, it seems do that their replacement to the middle sex facility. A lot of this seems to be very rushed, right? right? Yeah. It, you know, the whole thing seems so rushed that it, it, we were just told a few months ago that we're closing, yeah. and now they're scrambling. And it seems to give a little more time so that you can explore possibilities. Why not? Why destroy a building when you could actually use it? it well, it seems the suggestion for the kids from 16, what did you say, 16 to 20, 25. I mean, I know 25 isn't a kid, but it really kind of is. Or well, we're look, we're desperately, desperately looking for a women's prison. I, I mean, my God. I don't we, think there's enough room. There's not, well, there's 30 room. beds there. My guess is that there are a number of women that are in prison that should be in a different kind of facility, not. It's I would, not big I enough. I know it's not big enough for the, that. No. The women to Woodside. No. I mean, I, uh, with respect to the to the pictures that you took, we did a field trip there. Yeah. And, it, it did not seem like a facility where I, I think the design is conducive to people getting uh, better in a mental health. Not context. mental health. I'm talking about prison. Well, and I mean, we talked about the Norwegian well, model yeah. for, for prison. I think Woodside moves yeah. pretty far to the other yeah. end of the spectrum. Thank yeah. you. Um, are there any other questions for the witnesses? I think one last thing I would like to say, if I could, is that over the last uh, two and a half years that I've been back at Woodside in the role of clinical care coordinator, I had a nine-month break where I worked for economic services. Um, but since I've been back in the role as clinical care coordinator, I have been involved in several uh, conversations with Department of Mental Health for uh, interagency contacts where we were trying to streamline the best, cap uh, the best care available uh, f for clients, such as the one outlined in the Crawford, uh, Crawford case. Um, that relationship can be and should be fostered, and it should be improved, and it should be, uh, there should be a process by which uh, both of those services are available to the state at the same facility, in my opinion. And, in, and different level, understanding that there's a requirement uh, for the least restrictive placement available, that was why the, that pod and campus uh, proposal was the one that we got behind was because there could be different stages of care and different levels of security at each pod with a uh, response and a, and, a, and a staff capable of, of working on both mental health issues and behavioral issues. Well, that was what the proposal was a year ago. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for all you do. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to add to the I appreciate that. There's a child's name visible in one of these photos. I just want to make sure we redact it. Peggy, don't post that either. I just want to post that. All right. Thank you for Everybody where, where do you live? I, where do you live? Before we take a break. Um, okay. Best to you. I appreciate you know, it. I don't know what to say, but I, I do think. I don't think you propose it until you figure out what you're going to do with it. Until I've seen a viable plan. So my plan would be to have language in this bill that would require them to keep it open until they provided a viable plan and that would have to go if it's not by if it's in the interim while we're out of business here it would have to be approved by the justice oversight and the joint fiscal committee yeah that would be my plan at least to make sure that there's something viable out there um that you know cause we're we leave here on may 18th and you know it's it's like we, we lose all control, particularly in a, in a session that's the uh, end of a biennium. And so, um, you know, you see the bulldozers in there on yeah. July 2nd. Um, yeah. 
that doesn't make any sense. So that would be my recommendation that we as a committee propose some of these changes. And uh, we'll hear from the department. The plan is to take this up when we get back from our town meeting week. And we need to pass out the bill anyway because it's a juvenile justice bill. And so I will we'll schedule uh, Ken Schatz to get an update on the, um, on the RFPs and see where they're at and then put some language in what that I just described. Simple little bill. Okay, Brent you want has to talk a, a floor amendment. Um, the, and are you reporting this out today? No, we. Oh, you put it off till Wednesday. Wednesday we did that. <coughs> right. But part of the reason was this. Um, <coughs> this was the the compromised version that Pepper had suggested to make sure that you don't have uh, consecutive sentences that are. Oh, 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 oh right. The <coughs> so. Um, for the record, Bryn here from Legislative Jane, Council. And, and Mary Jane Hansworth from the parole board had concerns about the way it was. Right, and so, what the bill was? <coughs> no, so it was just the amendment. So if you remember um, the, the, the way that the bill originally dealt with that problem of, of when you get sort of a de facto life without no. parole by um, <coughs> imposing consecutive sentences. We had originally amended that consecutive sentences statute, so we restricted the court's authority to impose de facto life without parole. Um, and the, there was a suggestion from the state's attorneys to instead amend the parole eligibility statute um, to provide that sort of the, <clears throat> a person could serve um, no more than 35 years without being eligible for parole um, unless they were serving a life without parole sentence. So. Um, I think that the uh, representative from the parole board was not here when you heard that testimony, and you voted out the amendment right after, and there was some concern that the language wasn't quite clear enough, um, and that it may be read to impose a 35-year sentence on everybody. Um, oh. So we, um, the floor amendment that you have here is just replaces that whole section. I can easily do a, instances if you prefer. I don't know if you care. No. Um, so it just adds a couple words in, in both places to make it clear that um, anybody who's serving any sentence, unless it's life without parole, is eligible for parole no later than after serving 35 years. Um, so if you've got consecutive sentences that um, make your minimum term 45 years, you'll be eligible for parole at 35. This would be an amendment to myself, and then, you know, but I wanted to go through it with the committee. I don't know if you wanted to mention. No, I actually, the amendment, I think, is much clearer and fits much better. Mary Jane Ainsworth from the Pope Board, for the record. Um, this wording is much clearer. I did talk to the state's attorneys yesterday, and they were in agreement with similar language, would, as long as it meets the same. We, we wouldn't want the person who wasn't serving um, a life, uh, right. you know, Sentence who wasn't aggravated <coughs> would not be eligible until 35 if they were eligible sooner. Yeah, right. This is true. If they got 20 years, you would want them to wait another 15. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. So is this yeah. okay with everybody? Looks good. Yep, yeah. sounds fine. 